Uh, Ken Johnson is a professor at Oregon State University. His program focuses on plant pathology with an emphasis on disease ecology. He's been working with Fireboy for probably around 30 years, and so we're always happy to have him share his um, research. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about biopesticides, um, efficacy and use, and, and part of the research project that's ongoing, but also many years worth of information from Ken. And I guess I got the assignment of biopesticides. Uh, um, organic orange, okay, organic orange here. One, two, three, four. Okay, so you, you're, you're uh, by law kind of limited to biopesticides. Right? So, uh, first of all, I don't really know what the word biopesticides means. <laughs> I'm going to call them, I call them non antibiotic alternatives or non antibiotic chemicals. So that's kind of what, what I, I think the word biopesticides means. But uh, if you go and who's been to uh, whatever, GS Long, you know, grow, grower field grower session in, in Yakima or three, three days here in Wenatchee and listen to a pitch by some company on to buy my biopesticide. So they're out there, right? So <laughs> um, I, you know, just kind of the big picture of this is I, I think that, well, in, in, in Washington here, we have what, 14,000 acres of organic now where um, antibiotics have been uh, disallowed uh, in the organic program. So that has sort of put us into the biopesticide world pretty strongly. And then the bigger, the bigger picture is that you know, like Tiana said, I've been doing this for about 30 years. And uh, I think when I started, we would say, well, you know, antibiotics are under re regulatory pressure and you're using the agriculture and that's bad. And you see, you hear that a little bit now more with coppers as well. And Europe is, is in the process of trying to phase out coppers. And so that some of these materials that we see as pretty effective bactericides seem to always have this kind of you know, haze around them as, a, as, a, as to whether or not we're going to be able to keep using them in the future. And I, for one, would uh, fight like the Dickens uh, about trying to maintain uses of antibiotics and coppers for firewood. But I don't think that the alternatives that we have uh, are going to would help us uh, to avoid disasters. They'll help us, but they want to they want to disasters. So, with that, I'm going to talk about biopesticides. And you know, we're talking about a lot of soft chemistries. And, and understanding how they work, I think is important. Uh, and some of them, I'm not sure, uh, are necessarily gonna you know, make it in the long run uh, in spite of what they say at those grower meetings that we go to and they give us the sales pages. So, so on this grant that we have, we've got people all over the country and we're all interested in this, in this uh, question about biopesticides. And so you can, you can see some, you'll hear some of these people today and, uh, there's another one of these in about a week or two uh, from the other half of the country and the rest of the people are going to speak there. Um, so you may, when I look at control materials for, uh, for fire blight, I've sort of decided that there's three things we want the material to do. Uh, and one is to uh, significantly reduce the pathogen on the flowers that all this stuff that Anya and Gianna were talking about. Uh, and, uh, and antibiotics are pretty good at that. A lot of our biopesticides aren't so good at that. We'll get into that a little bit. Um, and then uh, the second goal is related, of course, would be good infection suppression. So if you don't have any pathogen on the flowers, you're not going to get any infection, right? So that kind of follows. Uh, and then uh, for us in the West, particularly, but everywhere, uh, the material has to have a low potential to mark the fruit. And by that, I mean by, by causing russeting. And russeting, as you know, is a, a disorder of the developing cuticle of the fruit. And generally, the fruit is most sensitive to this when it's been, when it's been fertilized and pollinated and fertilized, and it's starting to blow up like a balloon. And as it's blowing up, just like a balloon, the cuticle gets really Thin. And so right around petal fall in the two, two to three weeks after petal fall, you're really, really sensitive to, uh, uh, she's telling me to talk about it. Not too many people tell me to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you don't know what fruit rusting is, right? So, you know, and so this is the kind of the, the dilemma we have with a lot of these materials is that 
uh, do they do the things we want them to do? And then do they avoid doing the thing that we, that we don't want it to do? And it, it's sort of a paradox in this. And then one of the reasons that antibiotics is so good for fire blight is that, fire, that antibiotics actually kind of make the check in all of these. And I'll, I think I have a chart of that coming up. So. Um, so Tiana already showed this slide, but things that she works, the things that work pretty well uh, as alternatives to antibiotics. So antibiotics are on the top there, but uh, alum is a material that we've been working with. It's pickling salt, potassium aluminum sulfate. It's not registered yet, but uh, one company is now working on a registration. Uh, it, it really works by lowering the pH of the flowers is how it really works. And uh, and so for that reason, we could talk about rusting at the end, but uh, alum is pretty, pretty effective as you'll see as we go through this. Blossom well, Protect is the yeast. And to me, it is the foundational material of the non-antibiotic materials. If you're not using Blossom Protect, uh, even in conventional systems in the West here where it's dry, uh, I think you, you could be getting good, good effects on fire blight control with this material. Uh, and then, then she's got coppers up there and coppers are the next choice. And we all know that coppers are the materials that kind of lead us into some of these issues with rusting. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Then below that, she's got materials that we're all interested in, but, and they do something, uh, but um, it's been harder to make them work consistently. Uh, and so I think that the goal going forward with our project is to find, figure out where these materials fit and if we can give recommendations, particularly in our organic systems. Okay, this is my data, same thing. You can see I've got Blossom Protect over there on the left-hand side, uh, and it's like Serenade and Bravisto and Cueva and Lime Sulfur and Oxidate. One across, they're kind of in the middle. Uh, middling products, 50% control, and then alum again. Uh, alum, potassium aluminum sulfate looks really good. Uh, and, then, and then antibiotics over there on the, on the far right. And then uh, from the project here with all, all group members, this is uh, uh, different trials of Washington, California, New York, North Carolina, Michigan, sort of see the same thing. Uh, alum look really good in all of these trials. Uh, Blossom Protect and, and Buffer look, look pretty good. And then we get kind of into this middle range here where things look kind of so-so. Uh, and, uh, you know, that in figuring out if there's a place for these materials is, is sort of what we're trying to do in this project. Um, so let's talk first about, about the this development of epiphytic populations. People say we, we throw these charts and Tiana's thrown a few of the charts up already. Uh, how do we actually do this? Um, just so you have a clue. <laughs> so what we do is we go out in our orchard and we pick flowers. And you can see the flowers there. And we throw them in a plastic bag. And then we throw uh, usually about a, um, uh, a milliliter, like a thimble full of water per, per flower in the bag and wash them up and put them in a jewelry sonicator and shake them really hard. Get all the bacteria off, and the bacteria then are now in the water in the in the bag. And then uh, we make uh, some dilutions here, which is which is, which Tiana is showing here is like that would be the wash. That would be the wash from the bag in that tube, and then we make a one to one hundred uh, dilution of that, and a one to one hundred dilution of that. Okay, so. This would be, you know, if you took it, if you took a drop out of here now, you would have a dilution that you would have about one one hundredth of the wash in that drop. Okay, makes sense. If you took a, if you took a drop out of the second tube, you would have one ten thousandths of the original wash, right? And if you took a drop out of the third tube, you would have one one millionth of the drop of the original wash in the tube or in your in your pipe header, your pipe header, right? Makes sense. Everybody following that? Okay, then you just put them on a petri, petri dish, is which is what's shown there. So this would be the a sample that has a lot of pathogen in it. And so that's the wash. There's so many bacterial cells, you can't count them. The second one here, you know, if we, if we got on it right away, like when they're just starting to grow, uh, we, we could get on there and probably count this. But this would be the lower limit here. Every colony that we count here means that there's 10,000 more behind it, right? So right at that one means that means 10,000, right? The second one means 20,000 and so on. 
And then we get up to we get up to this this last solution here. Now every 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 colony that we count there means a million, right? So and so there's 12 colonies there. So that means that there's 12 million bacterial cells on the flower. Okay. That means that flower is probably dead. That that fruit is dead. That limb is probably going to die. Everything like that. And so so that's how we do this. Okay. People have asked me this before, and I've never actually ever shown it like this, but it's actually. Uh, kind of interesting to talk about. So does that makes sense to everybody. Okay. All right. Okay. So she's got some, you know, that's an animation here or words to go with the animation. So why is this important? Um, so this was some work I did a long time ago, but um, we did, we actually washed individual flowers one by one, lots and lots of individual flowers. Uh, and you know, and in in uh, in in trees, and put different treatments on them. So we put either just water on them, or we had a couple of biological treatments, or the on the treatment on the on the right is another antibiotic, but uh, but our but our uh, our strain of the pathogen was resistant to that antibiotic. And uh, what you see here is, so this would be. Uh, flowers that have more than a uh, hundred thousand bacteria on and that gave us about eight eight percent infection uh, and then this, this is the same thing this would be the flowers that have more than a hundred thousand bacteria on them and that gave us a uh, 0.1 percent infection and uh and and so on and you can go across here and what we decided was because so many of these other flowers all had uh, that pathogen on them, but uh, it didn't make any sense with the data. We got like a perfect correlation between uh, in, infection uh, and and flowers that had more than a hundred thousand bacteria on. Right. So that's what that we call that ten to the fifth. You'll say, well, like, what's the minimum number of bacteria that you need on a flower to get an infection? And it's about a hundred thousand or ten to the fifth. Right. And if you're below that, you probably don't have enough to get the flower infected. It's probably not going to happen. Okay, uh, so we so we talk about this, and so this kind of becomes a goal of, of a control program. Then, right? Can we keep the population below a hundred thousand bacteria per flower? That's what we're trying to do. Right? And that is easier said than done. Okay. All right. So. Um, all right, back to this. So we go out and we do this. We put treatments on trees. We measure the populations in the trees. Then I go through this, sorry. And, we, and then we get these charts. And Tian has already thrown, shown a couple of these charts. Uh, but so here's a couple of charts. Here's a chart of Kasumin. And so, and this is one where I put some citric acid on the trees as well. Uh, but if we look at this now, Kasumin, uh, is giving us about a million. So this number here, six, means a million. But not the, the, this is the Kasuma chart. This is the water treatment. So the water treatment is giving us about a million cells per flower, which we just learned will <coughs> cause an infection, right? All right. It's more than 100,000. We have a million. They're going to get infected, right? Whereas if we put Kasuma on the tree, uh, we're down around 1,000. Uh, bacteria per, per uh, so 10 to the 3 means 10 times 10 times 10 is a thousand, right? 10 times 10 is 100 times 10 is a thousand. So 10 times 10 times 10 is a thousand. So if we have this three here, that means that's about a thousand cells per flower. Uh, if we put a little citric acid in the consumer, now we're down closer to, to uh, uh, about a hundred cells per flower. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> what does that say about whether that tree is going to get that flower is going to get infected? Not going to happen, right? Okay, so that is an excellent chart. I said, nice chart. <laughs> so you get it? Nice chart. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's not a good chart? Well, this is an interesting chart here because here we put blossom protect on the on the tree and. And it doesn't matter if we put blossom protect on the tree or water on the tree, we're getting basically the same number, a million to 10 million cells per flower. Terrible chart, ugly chart, right? Not what we want to see. We didn't do anything. The thing is about blossom protect, blossom protect is the exception of the rule, which I'll show you in a minute. It actually works. 
at the, it actually works and we don't really understand how it works, but uh, this is what we're, uh, we're starting to figure out how it works, uh, which I think you're gonna see a lot more of in Fireblight research going, going forward, but there, I have a colleague in Connecticut that has just published a paper on why Blossom Protect works without diminishing the population on the, on the flower. And it has to do with inducing resistance in the flower, which is really, really interesting. I think you're gonna see a lot more work on this and a lot more work on why, why yeasts are effective uh, for fire blight control. But I just wanted to show you what a bad chart looks like here, all right? So, uh, and so this is sort of the extremes, right? So th like this chart here of Kasumin would be an excellent chart and something like this, even though Blossom Protect kind of works and it's an exception, uh, it's, a, it's a terrible chart. I think everybody gets that, right? Okay. So here's a lot of charts, all right? Uh, and so, um, so the, the way these things are, if it's blue, it's water and, and the treatments are below it. And so we see with antibiotics here, we are sort of down in this like, you know, a thousand cells per flower, uh, soluble coppers. Uh, we see that Provisto here looks pretty good. Here's our, this red line here on all of these charts is this 100,000 cells per flower the red line going across. We wanna be below that if we can. Um, we see that Provisto for most of the bloom period is keeping us below that. Cueva here, and this is three quarts of Cueva. So three quarts of Cueva is, Cueva is 1.7% metallic copper. And it's what we call a soluble copper material. All the coppers are in the solution, but it's only 1.7%. Whereas Provisto is closer to 3% metallic copper. And so the difference you see between these two lines is just the amount of copper there. That's what we think. And so, I mean, Tiana's talked about this quite a few times about getting, make sure you have enough, when you use copper, make sure that you have enough on the tree to do the right amount. And so we think like with Provisto, that three quarts is a good rate. Whereas with Cueva, we think you would have to go to four quarts to get a similar response, okay? And that's, that's one way that we can use these charts. Uh, here's alum. The one percent is the rate we talk about the most, and it's for the most of the bloom period. We're keeping the uh, the population below that ten to the fifth. Two percent. I don't think we'll ever use that. Be like sixteen pounds per hundred gallons. That's weight. That's a lot of alum. I don't ever see us using that. Uh, I've got some other ones here. Um, so what I call bacillus biorationals are things like serenade and double nickel and there's other ones, Prevant, um, Marone has one too. These are things where they fermented a bacillus bacteria in a tank and, uh, and then, and then they, they sell it based, not so much based on the live bacteria, but what they made during the fermentation process. So uh, Serenade is the classic example, but really old material been around a long time. Um, and the, the word biorational comes out of like things like BT and spinosad and stuff like that. The entomologists like to use the word biorational to describe these, these uh, materials. And so those are also made from bacillus bacteria. So bacillus is, uh, bacteria makes spinosad, spinillus bacteria make BT, Sp spinil bacillus bacteria make the antimicrobials that are in serenade, right? Um, in general, um, what we see with these things is that they aren't very inhibitory. So we're, most of the time, we're, uh, we're sort of above the line here with serenade. And, and so I, I have a tough time recommending ser serenade for the most important sprays uh, based on this, that it isn't going to really get after your, your pathogen population very well. And the same goes with phage. Phage are little viruses that attack Erwinia amylabra, the, the firefly pathogen. Uh, and if you do this in a test tube, they work great. The, the, the firefly pathogen dies, but out in the field, they don't seem to work. And one of the reasons is that they're very, very sensitive to sunlight. And so sunlight out there on a phage will deactivate it like in an hour or two. So we just don't see them work very well. And if they don't kill bacteria, the only thing they got, that's the only thing they got going for it for them, they don't protect the flower anyway. Whereas you think about it, material like serenade, it can 
it, it can do what it does to the population growing on the stigmas, but it also can sort of coat the, the, the nectary in the floral cup and give you some protection that way. So, so Serenade kind of has two ways of working potentially, whereas Fodge only has one. And, and the one way that it is supposed to work, we don't see it working in the future. Uh, there's some other ones here, essential oils, which would be like your thyme oils, your cinnamon oils, uh, some of your other plant extracts that you see out there. I just call them botanicals in general. They're materials that come from plants. They're sort of in the same category, kind of mushy. Uh, probably give you some protection of the floral cup, but don't do a very good job on, on the pathogen populations on the stigmas. And the same is also true with uh, the what I, what I call the peroxides and peracetic acids, which would be like jet egg or oxidate, they will give you a quick flash. They will kill whatever they can come in contact with, but then they are gone within minutes. They're just, they're just gone. They're, they've oxidized themselves. I mean, they're oxidizers and they, and they just disappear. So if you look at like Tiana's picture of all those nooks and crannies on a stigma and you spray oxidate on there, well, if there was a bacteria sitting up on the surface and on the top of that stigma, yeah, maybe you kill that one, but there's so many more down in the cracks and the grooves that they just rebound so quickly that, they, that it doesn't work very well. So there are some uses of these materials, which, which are hopefully I'll get to. All right. So our group has been um, taking the same kind of data all around the country on these things. And uh, so a couple things here is the yellow is strep. And in general, strep works really good for everybody, yay for strep. Uh, and the other one that works pretty good for everybody is alum, which is the blue here. Uh, and then everybody else is pretty much getting kind of these muddy lines with these bio, with these, uh, uh, with these uh, biopesticides. And so we, we, we would like to figure out why, but I, I, I kind of suspect that, you know, that we kind of know the answer is that they're just not that good at killing agents. Although some of them are probably better protective agents of the, of the floral cup than they are killing you. And so here I'm starting to fill the chart in now. Uh, so we, we, the goal here is significantly reduce pathogen numbers on flowers. Well, we can just kind of rip across you with antibiotics. They're pretty good on all these things. We start to go down this category of things that work pretty well. Um, so coppers and alum do a pretty good job on populations of the, of the bacteria in flowers. And then blossom protect, soluble coppers in, and alum do a pretty good job on infection suppression. And then I get over here with low potential to mark fruit. So now there seems to be a correlation as the better you are at killing bacteria, the better you are at potentially marking fruit. So remember that. <laughs> that is a sad, that is that is what the, our that is sort of our dilemma. Okay. And, and so uh, there are things that I don't think mark fruit, and that's things like serenade. I, long history with serenade. I don't think it can mark fruit. Botanicals. It, I think the jury's out. The data sets aren't as big. I guess I've had enough converse, phone conversations with people that feel like they've had some issues with that, with some of the botanicals. Not going to put a check there. Same with oxidizers. And then I don't think phage, because of what they do, mark fruit, but I also don't think they're very effective. So you kind of end up with, you know, to, be, to get a check here, you have to be pretty good at what you do, right? And so I left a lot of things kind of unchecked. I don't, I don't have any X's there, you know. But uh, I think that when you put these things together, uh, the key is you really to, to at least be trying to grab a hold of, a, of the checks where you can. And then if we're talking about end of bloom or toward petal fall, maybe going to something else that, that isn't going to give you a potential to mark fruit, uh, which for me it is, is, the, is serenade is the material I always recommend. Okay. So, um, so, uh, so to me that there's, there's kind of, we've been looking a lot of individual biopesticides, right? And there's sort of two issues. And one is uh, understanding this environmental variability uh, and how it affects our goals and what we're trying to achieve with the material. And uh, we're doing that. And I think that that is gonna get somewhere, but I don't know if it's gonna get where we want. And, and I'm more interested in, in using specific properties of biopesticides and sequences 
uh, that optimize the goals. And this is what we've tried to develop for organics in Washington State here. And so I think I'm gonna jump ahead because I'm probably using a little too much time here. Um, so we're looking at environmental data all across the country, trying to just get a, a, a set of environmental data and how these materials respond in these environmental data is like solar radiation and, and temperature and humidity and rainfall and so on. Um, so we're gonna have this to be able to maybe helpfully, helpfully, hopefully help understand these things a little better. I'm a little skeptical about that, but um, everybody's got weather, right? So um, the second thing here is, I mean, to, to me, what I think what we've been able to accomplish with biopesticides is this sequencing idea, right? To use these materials in the right sequence. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, how many people have heard me talk before? A few people, right? And you've seen this chart before, right? Yeah. So this is probably my favorite slide, right? And I, I tell you, if you don't have it hanging in your spray shed and you're an organic grower, you should probably put it up a couple, right? Uh, so, uh, so Tiana's already talked about some of this stuff like fixed copper sanitation if Fireboy was in the orchard last year. Uh, lime sulfur thing, not going to go into that, but um, you guys do it and you guys know what you're doing. When I talk about it, I, pri I primarily talk about it how, how Harold Austinson first introduced it, like spraying early around King Bloom uh, and, and, uh, and then repeating it once a couple of days later. And if you can get that lime sulfur done early like that, and I know this depends on the cultivar, but then it sets you up for the rest of these materials during for fire blight control so much better. And I do know that there's cultivars like Pink Lady and so on that this is really hard to do. And, uh, uh, and I have a lot of conversations with uh, say PCAs with GS Long and things like that about how to best accomplish some of this where lime sulfur's kind of moved around in the spray program. <laughs> but when I present it, I just kind of present it like that and then we can, we can talk about it. So, to me, the foundation of using these materials is to put blossom protect on at about 80% bloom. It's amazingly effective. You just have to do it once. Uh, it really sets you up. And even in conventional systems, this is an awesome treatment. It really is. Uh, in the West, where it's dry, we're in a desert environment, uh, it, it really is a good treatment. Uh, and then moving into that, uh, after that is in, this depends on weather now. This, this depends, it depends a little bit. You're just gonna kind of maybe have to make the choice to do this, not looking at the weather so much. It's 80% bloom. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna be a blight year, a bad blight year or not. Uh, I might need to make this investment just to set my foundation on blight control, right? That, that's, and, uh, and I think that's important because I don't know how much flexibility you really have with this material. Uh, but when we get into the after full bloom here, we can start getting into, into uh, looking at the weather, right? What does cougar blight say? What does Murray blight say? And so on. Uh, and to me, the, the best choice of material, and I'll show you why in a second, is, is Previsto close to shortly after full bloom. And that's because it's gonna get after those pathogen path populations in the flower, right? Uh, in, whereas serenade won't, okay? So serenade kind of lets the pathogen keep growing. Blossom Protect kind of lets the pathogen keep growing. Uh, a copper material at this, at this timing is the one material that we have that, that, that gets after the pathogen growth in the flower. Uh, so we're still, you know, we're not at the infection period yet. We're, we're hopefully we're not too far into full bloom. We're not at a place where we're still really starting to worry about fruit marking. Okay, so these are all the things that are going through our head at this point. Uh, so um, so there's that. And then at Petal Fall, uh, this is where I'm starting to really think about fruit marking. And this is where I would go to a, a serenade type. And serenade is not going to do much for the pathogen in the flowers, but it is going to do give us that protection of the floral cup for a couple of days out there uh, and get us through the infection. Okay. So if we've done all, all three of these things, if, and it, it's going to depend on the year, of course, for the weather and so on, but if we've done all three of these things, we get pretty good control. Okay. So 
actually excellent control. And one other material that you know that I talked to PCAs quite a bit about uh, is I, I put red apples there. I just what I mean is uh, cultivars that aren't super russet sensitive, uh, which is which is most red apples, but there's probably some other ones. That lime sulfur at Petal Fall is also a pretty effective treatment uh, for fire blight, but also for other things, getting after mildew, getting after storage rot fungi, starting to get a hold on the fruit, uh, and so on. And then some people have some problem with sulfur at that time because there's going to be an oil going on for mites not too long after that. So these are the kind of things you have to really talk to your, uh, your pest control advisor about in order to get this timing right. Um, but uh, so that it's another consideration. One of the things about lime sulfur at that timing is it will take blossom protect off the tree, which is a good thing if you think about it in terms of while well, our window of light susceptibility is finishing, it's closing, and our window of potential fruit marking is, is opening. And if I can get some of that yeast off the tree with a lime sulfur at petal fall, that might be helpful from a, from a fruit market marketing point of view, okay? All right, well, hopefully I'm, got, am I making you think? <laughs> no? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, so this is a chart I show uh, just to sort of summarize this. Uh, and this is a lot of trials, so that when it says water at the top, that's actually 10 trials. So that's a lot of trials, that's years of work. Okay, and here's our red line again there, 10 to the fifth going across, uh, numbers. Uh, so water doesn't keep us there, we're gonna get lots of infection, right? Blossom Protect, this is our one application of Blossom Protect, that is only three trials in this case, but it's not doing much. This is two applications of Blossom Protect, it does a little better. The buffer is a citric acid-based buffer. It's fairly acidic. It does knock on the population, but so two applications of lots of that uh, kind of keeps us around in this line. Um, these are the two I really want to really want to show you. So all of these are getting one blossom protect in the beginning. Okay, so there's one blossom protect in the beginning. Okay, and then the second treatment is either Serenade or Provisto. And then the third treatment is either Provisto or Serenade, okay? And so this is, this is why I say that getting that copper on here is better than a Serenade because we drop it down now to this 1,000 level as opposed to a 10,000 level, all right? And putting the copper on late um, didn't do that much for actually taking populations off the tree, whereas with the Serenade late, uh, we sort of keep that trend going where the copper got it down, got it down fairly early and we put the serenade on late and we don't see the population growing up. And then on the bottom here was, was the treatment of streptomyces. Okay. So that sort of go, that's my chart and that's the data that explains that chart, right? The spray program. Okay. All right. Um, and so then control from this. So, uh, I try to condense this down. These are these programs. You might want to take a picture of this, but um, so you get about, you know, let's say eight antibiotics down here, 85% control. Okay. Uh, Blast and protect and alum twice, 85% control. Uh, I guess I can read this on my screen. Uh, Provisto or Blast protect and Provisto and then something else, 85% control. All right, so we're, we're getting numbers that we can live with. I mean, these are inoculated trials. We are coating these trees with the fire blight pathogen and we're getting really good control, right? Whereas if I go blast and protect and serenade and then something else could be serenade or I don't, I drop off quite a bit. So this is, this is the effect of getting that population down sometime right after full bloom. And this is when you're gonna be first watching the forecast for cougar blight the cougar blight says, well, the next five days, we're going to start to bump up. At the bottom of that curve is a good time to put that provisto on. Okay. All right. All right. So, all right. So, and then marking. Okay. Um, you know, here's my, here's my conclusion on this. No surprise, but the more effective non-antibiotic materials for, the more effective aid, I didn't write this right. The more effective a non-antibiotic, 
antibiotic material is for infection suppression, it shows a higher potential to mark fruit. So this is this is where I'm trying to uh, make some headway here is getting you to understand that this is russeting from Blossom Protect. And this was a trial we did where we put the Blossom Protect on really after petal form. So it was so late, not what you want to do. It's actually not allowed on the label, but Blossom Protect, if it gets wet enough or if you put it on late enough, it can mark some fruit, okay? Um, this one over here is alum, which is why I worry about alum a little bit. You mark some fruit with, with petal fall applications of alum, all right? This one here is Previsto at full bloom and lime sulfur at petal fall, and it looks pretty good. So, and I don't necessarily have to go lime sulfur at, at petal fall, but I went Previsto and Serenade, and that looked really good too. All right, so um, just things to think about with these things, okay? I'm just about done here. So. All right. Okay, that I am done here, so. <laughs> All right. <laughs>